Hello, and welcome to Revive Health's Daily Briefing Live for Friday, May 29th, our 30-minute review of the latest and most important news, resources, and advice for health system marketers and communicators. Um, I'm Jared Ustery, uh, your guest host for today's show, and I'm joined by Chase Kleckner, Senior Marketing Manager at Revive Health and our show's producer. Uh, hi, Chase. How are you doing? How was your Memorial Day? Hey, Jared. It's good to have you on the show. It was good. My wife and I actually decided to redesign our bathroom. Uh, so that's what we're working on right now. We're past this stage of it being like, oh, what did we do? <laughs> and are starting to see some progress. So uh, it was a good weekend to work on that project. I need to check on Home Depot and Lowe's stock because surely they're doing okay, right? Like surely they've seen a bump. Yeah. Um, we're also joined by Alan Shoebridge. Um, if you guys don't know, Alan is the Director of Marketing Communications for Salinas Valley Memorial Healthcare Services down there in California. He's also held senior marketing and leadership uh, communications leadership roles at Providence, uh, St. Joseph Host Health, and Kaiser Permanente, and is known by a lot of folks in our field for his blog, which you can check out, alanshoebridge.com. Um, hey, Alan, also, you had a great post recently around 80% healthcare economy. You want to uh, kind of tell us a little bit more of that concept? I, thought, I found it really intriguing. Sure. Well, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, I've been doing a lot of um, kind of, I don't know, soul searching about what's going on in our industry. And, you know, to me, one of the things that uh, really stands out is what's been the impact on the people that were our patients and our potential consumers uh, before this and what does it mean now? And obviously, we all know the um, health impacts and what that's done. That's very obvious. But I think there's also the economic side of that, too. And um, I don't know, probably some point in, in early May, I had seen this post about how the whole economy might not go back to more than 80%. You know, if you're running a business, you probably should not count on getting 100% of your previous business back. You know, you may get 80% back. You know, if you're running a restaurant and you have uh, restrictions about what you can do, you're not going to get your entire uh, base back. And I thought, you know, that makes a lot of sense too. We're going to see that in healthcare. We're not going to get 100% of our volume back. So, you know, it's probably going to be somewhere in that 80% range. And so then what do we need to do about that? You know, how do we need to think about our plans? And so I do feel like we're probably experiencing much less than 80% now. Um, but even when we kind of get back to more full strength, we might be sitting at that sort of 80%. And what do we need to do? And so that, that was the idea. And I, I kind of stole it. Um, it's from uh, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, who's awesome. He's a great thought leader. And he was talking about the economy as a whole, but I think we're going to be experiencing that in healthcare. And we may be experiencing that uh, for quite some time. And so we need to be prepared for it and, and think about reacting. Yeah, that's great. And you guys have been doing some cool work, which we're going to get to touch on a little bit later uh, in the show. The meat of the show is all about how Salinas Valley has been able to respond. So we're really looking forward to uh, hearing a little bit more about that. Um, but as we get in, um, as with each show, we plan on covering the news of COVID-19, how it relates to marketing communications. We're going to highlight some resources, share what we're hearing and seeing uh, from Marcom professionals around the country. Um, and we'll open the floor for questions. Um, as we move the show, if you guys don't mind, just use the question queue in Zoom. Uh, please use the chat for, you know, talking to other uh, folks who are uh, joining. But if you want to have the question in the queue for answering, please use that question queue. Um, we'll also provide any relevant links in the chat um, so you can access those immediately. Um, one quick mention, uh, we have a lot of folks who listen after the fact. So uh, if you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts, just search for Revive Health daily briefing live. Uh, we'll be posting recording uh, at the end of the day uh, today uh, at thinkrevivehealth.com slash COVID-19, as well as any other content we've dealt, developed related to the crisis. Uh, a couple of really important notes. Uh, first off, um, we're not experts on COVID-19 from a medical or scientific perspective, not the place for that. There are wonderful resources, thank goodness for the CDC and others for those areas. Um, but we do have some opinions uh, on how marketers and communicators might want to manage the crisis. Uh, but we also know that your situation is unique. And in the end, you have to make the decisions that are right for you and the hospital and the environment organization market you're in. So with that, let's get going. Um, a couple of things, we want to get into the news. Um, we always start with the latest case count. Uh, and it's, it's been a bit of a sobering week. Um, it's really important for, I think, all of us in healthcare to keep track of the crisis. Um, because we'll know both when it is hopefully peaking and when it's going to be receding. Um, it also provides that context of how we're doing. Um, for our numbers, we use the Johns Hopkins dashboard. Um, right now around the world, 
there are um, a little over 5.8 million confirmed cases. Um, and that's resulted in about 361,000 um, confirmed lives lost. Um, and in the US, um, we've seen uh, 1.7 million confirmed cases. And that's resulted in, as I'm sure everyone has seen, over, um, about 101,000 um, deaths, uh, lost lives in the US. Um, so th this is a, a pretty staggering number this week. I th it feels like it's in a different world almost. Um, Alan, last time you were on the show, I think, was back in March. Um, Chase, do you remember what, the, what, that, what those counts might look like back then? Yeah, we were actually just talking about when Alan was on the previous show last time, and we had just over 500 deaths in the U.S. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in March, which just, I mean, it just feels like a different uh, time back then with, with that little count um, in cases, so. Alan, I bet it feels like a different time for you too. It feels like it's probably been a, a bit of a warp speed time. Yeah, and you know, I think it's it's just hard to conceptualize of that sort of increase over a you know two and a half month period. It's really hard to to do, and you know, it makes me think a lot too. And you know, it's in our roles in healthcare marketing communications. You know, we're helping. We're on we're we're on the backside of it. And to think about all the frontline caregivers who have dealt with so many of those patients and the and the toll that takes, it just it's pretty staggering and it's hard to put it into perspective. And I think, you know, I was reflecting back to that last phone call and I, I just really don't know if I thought it would be this bad or it wouldn't be that bad or it'd be worse. And it's hard to know, but yeah, it's, it, those are like really sobering numbers. And I, you know, again, you're like, when is this going to kind of ebb? And that, that's the hard part. We still don't know. Yeah. And I, we, we're in this weird, unique position, I think in hospital marketing communications where we have to be like comfort salve and, and action at the same time, because we all know what, what's, you know, happening with the perspective. So a couple of areas though, uh, one news article we want to touch in, um, Alan, you brought this up, which I think is really cool in the pre-show. Um, you kind of mentioned that there's in this like April and the early part of May, we've been talking about it for a while now, but like the numbers have kind of come in and I mean, the, 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 the changes are pretty massive. Uh, we'll post a link to this article from, um, uh, revenue, uh, uh, intelligence, uh, ref cycle intelligence. Uh, but the volume numbers are, I mean, and they're, they're pretty drastic. People are really afraid to get care. So any, um, any thoughts you have, what are you guys seeing uh, there in um, Salinas Valley? Yeah, well, I'd say, you know, April was a very slow month compared to what we've seen traditionally. And, you know, as we kind of ramped up, you know, in March, um, you know, I think we expected things to drop off because, again, people were scared and we were putting our own processes into place. And then April, you know, as we got more confident, like we understand exactly how we're handling this. The hospital is safe. We started messaging that more because we were seeing people put off critical care. So, you know, they're getting stroke symptoms or feeling like they might have a heart attack and people are waiting too long. And, you know, when we, when we realized that, you know, wait, wait a second, we can be telling these people it's safe to come in. We've had the processes and protocols in place for weeks. We know we're going to be able to separate out um, COVID potential patients from anyone else who's coming in. So we need to start explaining that. So, you know, I think we started doing that toward the mid to late part of April. And we started, we actually started seeing, I think, some better volumes coming in just in terms of people um, not putting off the ER, EB care is still an issue and we're still messaging it a lot, but we're kind of going right at that. And then, you know, just in the last uh, couple, just the last week or so, we've restarted our scheduled surgeries process. And again, that was done with a lot of, you know, forethought for safety, but really that month of April, I know across the nation, right? Just people were not seeking out care. And if they even probably wanted it, a lot of hospitals couldn't offer it. You know, they were shut down some states completely ruled out elective surgeries. Some states had very narrow bands of what they could accept. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I, the months, it's a staggering number in terms of financial cost to health systems across the country. You know, I'm hoping that we see, you know, April, late April, early May, things may have started turning. And then, you know, as you get to the end of May, early June, that you're getting back to, I don't know, maybe it's not the 80%, um, but it's climbing that road to get back to that sort of 80% healthcare economy like we were talking about at the start of the call. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a critical moment. In terms of, um, and you know, if you guys need any resources, of course, we always have the COVID-19 page you can go to for Revive Health, but I'd love to just kind of dig in and guys get started in the actual meat of this. Um, you kind of already just start described kind of the early evolution of COVID-19, but are there anything else you want to add about what you guys saw there that was kind of unique or different than the rest of the country? Anything that was like a little different from, or maybe even California as a whole, it's always an interesting state to kind of see how it, things progress. Well, California was interesting because they did get really aggressive super fast with lockdowns and shutdowns. So, you know, probably the most aggressive in the country without having a huge amount of cases. So things were getting shut down really quickly. Where, where we're located, 
is on the central coast of California or about two hours south of the Bay Area, San Francisco. So, you know, we kind of have followed or trailed them a little bit. So as the Bay Area shut things down to kind of work its way down the coast, we did too really quickly. So we shut down here where I'm located in Monterey County pretty quickly. We do have some interesting, you know, demographics and dynamics in our community, which one thing is where I'm located in Salinas and the hospital is located, there's a large agricultural industry there. They call it the salad bowl of the world. <laughs> um, I never heard that until now, but I hear it now, I know it uh, really well, but so much produce uh, for the entire world comes from here. Well, a lot of that labor is, comes in a seasonal. So all of a sudden you've got thousands of employees, you know, coming in, um, they're living in very cramped conditions, they're working in very tight conditions. So that's something that, you know, we started seeing some cases popping up. And we got really aggressive about trying to educate them. So we've sent our nurses out into the fields. So we've actually had nurses conduct um, training with ag workers in the field about sanitation, both um, at, at their work site in the fields and then also where they go back and live. Um, we've helped donate masks. So there's been a real effort to potentially stem what would be a really vulnerable population that could have a big you know, surge in cases to get in front of that. So that's been something that's been really specific to our market. And now, you know, we're starting to reopen the county more and we're kind of doing that. So again, it's been, I'd say too, we've seen kind of this plateau of where our numbers have been, you know, kind of not flat, but not necessarily a big spike and then a big drop. It's actually been kind of more of a slowly ramp up and we actually have more inpatients in our hospital now than we ever have, but it's still manageable. We still only have about eight positives uh, inpatient in our facility which is completely manageable, but we're constantly looking out like, well, where could that next surge come from that makes it difficult? And that's where we started looking at, you know, working with that population, like the ag workers, like let's get a real strategy so that we don't get faced with that kind of surge. Wow. wow that's a really great proactive strategy. You also have, I mean, um, there's a large, I mean, I think Slim's family overall, there's a large Hispanic population, right? So like you guys have probably had to do some interesting outreach or new outreach for that uh, community. Uh, just maybe unique to us, a few listeners as well. Yeah, and I, you know, in Salinas specifically in the city, it's you know over seventy percent of the just regular population is Hispanic. Um, you when you bring in kind of the agricultural workers, that's a lot more that adds on to that. And so you know, we've always been good about um, trying to think about cultural competency of our care, offering uh, bilingual education, offering Spanish-speaking materials and, and products. So we've always done a good job of that, but I think what we've ramped up a little bit are things like just doing a little bit of experimentation about reaching this audience. So we had a, a Facebook live uh, event about two or three weeks ago where we had a, a Spanish speaking physician, the whole um, Asset Experts Facebook live event was done in Spanish. Um, we had a peak of like 800 viewers at one point uh, live, you know, and that was really great. And I think at the time, um, there was just not a lot of information about COVID-19 in Spanish that was felt like anywhere localized, like what's going on in my local area? Where could I get information? Even I think, you know, it's a challenge for Spanish speakers to get good information at any time. Um, you know, so that was something we could do, highly personal, highly relevant, um, local physician and in Spanish. And that had a really good, um, uh, really good reception. And we're kind of thinking about like, how do we sort of reach people where they are and how do we do it um, in a language that again, like a lot of people in our market do speak and we need to, to be sensitive to that and give them information that'll be helpful. Wow, that community level of community outreach is uh, pretty fantastic, I think, from just working with other health systems. Uh, it's fantastic and the, the, the level you guys have customized it for the population just, yeah. Um, but you guys have also kind of, now that you've kind of dealt with a lot, it sounds like the early stages of this, you've also kind of jumped into scheduling surgeries again. And uh, I think Tuesday of this week, actually. Uh, can you get, kind of give us an update on how that's going and the lessons you've learned along the way? Yeah, well, it was a really, uh, you know, deliberate, cautious, process. So, you know, we worked on kind of uh, what do we need to do for several weeks ahead of time and put a really great triage pr uh, process in place, figuring out, you know, how do we test the people a couple days before they come in to make sure they don't have COVID-19? How do we give them instructions to isolate uh, between the test and when they're going to come in for the surgery? So all that was happening over a couple of weeks, trying to figure out exactly what that process is. And then last week, we started doing a few surgeries with the process in place, see how it worked. And then on Tuesday of this week, like you said, turn it back on to a kind of another level. We took the next ramp up and, you know, again, just being very deliberate. And I think in terms of our sort of communications and marketing around that, 
um, you know, we start internally and make sure that our employees know exactly what we're doing, um, make sure they're very reassured about the process, that they could explain it to anyone who asked them about it. I think that's really important. So we had a number of communications on that. And then we sort of took that message and we started putting it out externally. And we've done that in the last couple of days. And earlier this week, um, on Wednesday, our CEO put out a message about, you know, our process. We've got something up on the blog. We, you know, we are really trying to reinforce again that we did this thinking through, you know, what would the best practices would be, how to make it safe and, and really being cautious. Because again, we're looking at, again, we don't have that huge drop off of COVID-19 kids. We've still got cases in the county. So we're being very safe and very deliberate about how we're opening it back up. Yeah, that's great. And I love the fact that you guys focused on internal audiences first. I feel like that is such the right approach because I think, you know, it, when I think of how I react to healthcare, I think this is for a lot of people, they call it the pe person that is their closest medical advisor. I, I call it like the, 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 the medical network, right? Of like your personal network is your medical network in so many cases, right? I have a friend from high school who I text and say, he's, he's a neurosurgeon. So he's really probably sick of hearing me talk, text uh, my, about my dad and getting any heart problems. He probably doesn't want to hear that anymore, but you know what? He's always super helpful. And I think that's the way a lot of folks do. So it seems like a really good, especially in communities where we re relationship matters so much. It feels like the right kind of move. Uh, were there any interesting takeaways from the internal communications? Anything that uh, employees raised their hand and said, well, I have any questions or uh, maybe even things they learned along the way? Yeah, well, we since, since mid-March, we've been doing daily email updates uh, and on our, and our internet as well. So people are getting news every single day. And it's a decently heavy lift to do that. Um, but the thing is, we don't run out of news. So I keep wondering, like, are we going to run out of things to say? But we don't because between you know, what we're doing with processes and procedures and what's happening with our news in the county and all that, there's always been something to say. And so we just kept the dialogue going really, really just proactively and just keep that daily dialogue going. And we've got great feedback from people. They've been really happy with what's been shared. We've done some surveys to check in and make sure people are getting what they need. But I think just that repetitiveness of the, the message is so important. And I, you know, I know that there's some, a lot of other systems are kind of doing really regular communications, but I was kind of struck by some that told me oh we're only talking to employees once a week or we haven't really up to up the the volume and i'm like wow you know i think that's a missed opportunity because again we don't want any um, gaps in knowledge from our employees to what we're putting out to the public so again it would be a huge miss to have the public know about us reopening for surgeries before the employees know about it right so we've got to be really deliberate about that and so that's been our sort of cadence is when we look at sharing information we share it internally first get some good knowledge, some deep understanding of it going, and then we share it out with the public. And I think that cadence like super important and it's going to be continue to be important as we go into the next steps of all this stuff. Yeah, that, we've actually heard some really great things. Like I, <laughs> I'm afraid I was talking to one client and they, and they were telling me how internal communications during this crisis has told people they can do communications really, really well. Um, so that was a really helpful thing to see. Um, I also, someone asked the question, uh, what media did you use for daily news? What was the open slash read rate? So uh, any, any insights there? Yeah, so honestly, it, was just, it wasn't fancy. We've just done Outlook. And, you know, we've used some formatting and, and, and done a good job of linking things and everything, but we just use Outlook for now. Um, we're looking at some more robust tools, but the way I kind of gauged response is through surveys. So sending out some surveys to the people getting and saying, how often do you open this? Do you find it valuable? Has it increased your knowledge? So in lieu of having better analytics, because we are using Outlook right now, um, using those poll surveys. And then we also, we have a, a feature at the end, you know, hey, if you have questions or comments, submit them. And we get a lot of people who just sort of respond and say, thanks for sharing this. And the other thing is, anytime I've ever made any mistake, we get like 10 emails. So someone says, hey, you know, the date was wrong on this or with LinkedIn work. And I appreciate that because that feedback we want and we want to fix those things. They don't happen too often, but when they do, like that's the key, like, okay, I know people are reading this. And we had another one that was sort of funny where we were doing uh, a raffle item during hospital week. And wow, we got so much response. So I guarantee like those are those, those checkpoints. You're like, I know people are reading this email because as soon as we put something out there, we've got 45 response to what we're looking for. So it's been, I wouldn't say it's a highly scientific, but using the surveys has helped uh, to get that feedback. That's awesome. And then I'm going to try to combine a question. And um, so another question was, what were the major barriers to access surgeries expressed by the population? And what did you do to work to overcome them? And then I think I want to pair that with another topic I want to bring up, which is escalation of messaging. I mean, those two things kind of go hand in hand. How did you escalate appropriately, but also kind of address for fears and uh, concerns of the population around? 
Yeah, well, the, the first off, the major barrier was the state basically kind of put it out an edict to shut it down. So, I mean, you know, you, you really had to have a very narrow band of services that you felt like you could offer that would meet that edict. So that that kind of like changed the game right there, you know, so you're getting regulatory sort of advice of like, this should not be done, this cannot be done. Um, and I think, you know, but that, that probably also feeds into how people might think about it. They've heard things are shut down, maybe that, that creates some fear and anxiety. I think what we've tried to message again is just being very deliberate about what our process is. Here's what we set up to screen people who are gonna need the surgeries. Here's our process for making sure you're safe. Here's the steps we've taken at the hospital to do enhance, you know, things like and it was simple, but enhanced sanitation or diverting, you know, our COVID patients are in a completely separate part of the hospital. So they're, they have some isolation. So just trying to explain to people like what your experience will be like um, at the hospital prior. So your testing, um, your directions for isolating, and then once you get here, what you might need. So it's just been very deliberate. I, but I think, you know, I, I mean, people are going to continue to be scared. It's just, it's natural. And so we're trying to help educate them. And we've also tried to make it personal and, and on the, like the ER issue and uh, with people not coming into the emergency room, we've done like videos, we've done podcasts, we've done Facebook live, where we actually have the physicians sort of talking, the experts, like, here's why it's safe, here's what we've done. And, and I think that's worked well too, to put some humanity into it, because again, you can put out an article or something, but that doesn't have like the same impact of like, why don't, why don't you listen to one of our ER nurses talk about why you shouldn't put off your care, why we're here, why it's safe. And I think just kind of reinforcing that message over all these different media types has been a, a good strategy and we've gotten good engagement on all that. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, you guys are also not just focused on what's um, happening with surgeries now, the ramp up, but you're also kind of looking to the future a little bit. And you guys have been working on a campaign, um, I think the Be Well campaign, right? And you're going to kind of use that in the upcoming month. So do you want to tell us a little bit about the purpose of the campaign? And uh, we can kind of jump into a couple of details around it as well. Yeah, I think that was to really kind of set the stage for, again, there's this really great feeling of affinity for healthcare providers in the nation right now, which is really nice. Um, but, you know, a lot of healthcare systems have been kind of shy about doing, I guess, what you'd call like traditional advertising, right? So, and again, for part of the time, we probably didn't want to because there was a ramp up of making sure we wanted to be safe, making sure people were staying at home, things like that. But again, now as we're moving into where things are opening up and, but still people need a message of what they should do. And so we are looking at kind of what I would say is probably more of like a traditional kind of brand level campaign, but really giving people some uh, thoughts on how they can stay connected, how they can be well, reinforcing some of the message we want to do, and also kind of reinforcing the connections we have. So the idea, I think, is really just to set the stage in a sort of a softer way for people to start thinking about healthcare again, to start thinking about us, um, how we want to support them, how they kind of have like that two-way relationship with the people who come to us. So again, it's not a direct message of saying, you know, we're safe and don't entrust us. You know, it's more on the lines of like, we're looking out for you. And I, we're hoping that, you know, that combined with some of the specific education things that we do to talk about these issues specifically gives sort of like a nice one, two punch. And I think that's always, in my opinion, that's always a good way to approach your marketing is you have some level of high brand type messaging that's more aspirational, that's building affinity and preference. And then you have other things that are doing very specific interactions like trying to drive volume to the service or utilization of video visits or education. So this is giving us sort of that top level that, really just hasn't been there right now because again, we've really, this is that it hasn't really necessarily been appropriate to start thinking about that until now. I will say we looking at the creative, man, you guys like, uh, and Chase, if you want to add anything here, it, it, the emotion is so right. Like it feels like it's calm and confident and collected and just like, like a good advice from like a senior member of the community. It just, it felt like so well done from, from that perspective. And it feels like there's like, you guys have kind of created some good room. Uh, I think we will be able to share the creative assets uh, like in the, at some point in the future. So if you guys can look at the page or maybe even in chat for those things. So look at the TV spot, look at the broadcast. We're going to jump into some more details around it, but um, Chase, anything else you saw when you, uh, look through the different pieces yeah and i just shared this uh, my screen with some of the examples but i think i think exactly what you said jared just a kind of a calm voice for everyone um and as we've always seen from our research like the health system is the place people are looking for and trust the most and and this message i think creates and it kind of sends that message of, of safety and uh in control of it you know um so i think it's really really strong yeah, Ellen, what were you guys thinking when you guys saw the, when you guys saw the creative went through things and then we'll uh, kind of maybe talk about how this campaign will evolve over time. 
Yeah, well, it's funny. I mean, I think one of the challenges of doing creative right now is just the speed to try to get something in that's sort of relevant. And so, you know, we usually, I would say like, you know, building a, a campaign is a couple months worth of work. And I think we try to do it less than a month, which again, I feel like is, it came out really well. Um, but things like, you know, doing a lot of detailed focus group testing and things we would do with message testing, it just wasn't time for that. So, you know, we was able to kind of get some input in different ways and things. But um, yeah, I think that the evolution is, and again, um, I think there's a real point in time here where all the messages that were kind of up there about, you know, staying safe, you know, being home when you can, um, but being connected too. So, you know, not letting those connections go away. And it's funny, I mean, we're obviously having this meeting by video chat and all that, but, you know, and we kind of joke about Zoom fatigue, whatever, but it's really important to keep those connections going because honestly, even as some of the restrictions lift, being home as much as you can is still the right thing to do, right? So, I mean, if you can do it, um, you know, it's good, especially if you're in an area where you're seeing numbers go up or you're seeing them kind of stay the same, like, again, so those sort of messages that I think are really pertinent right now, but then, you know, again, in a month or two from now, we might shift to something else and try to be like, well, we'll take the campaign and evolve it a little bit, but now maybe we're actually trying to, you know, drive some volume somehow, or it's more aligned to some sort of service line or things. I don't know. That's the future that could exist. But I also think that, you know, you hear so much talk of like, well, what's going to happen in the fall? Are we going to have another strong wave of this where we may have to go back to a shelter in place? We may have to go back to the restrictions that you saw in the Bay Area and things. They might have to do it again. And then, so then I feel like this campaign is great because, you know, it's, it's rearing all those messages. So I think that's one of the keys for, you know, developing creative right now is like, can the message be flexible to adjust to whatever's going on in your market? Because honestly, that could change in 30 days. I mean, you could get something could happen. I mean, I'm still worried about all these images we saw over Memorial Day of pool parties and things. <laughs> I mean, it's great fun, but where are we going to be like in two weeks? And so in some market, uh, you could have a very big shift. So I think having some creative that can adjust to the conditions very quickly that you can adapt with some small tweaks and just get messages out is really helpful right now. And I think that's what we tried to build. Yeah. So knowing we uh, just a little bit of time left, what, what channels you guys touched on and then maybe some, how you got to plan to measure the campaign uh, yeah. just because I think it's always helpful to hear. Yeah. So I'm pretty, it's, it's going off, I would say almost everything. So traditional broadcasts like radio and TV, but also digital social, we're also uh, integrating elements and things like our newsletter and everything. So it's going to be kind of, I would say on the press and over everything. And honestly, like this is not a campaign to necessarily drive heads and beds kind of thing. And it's not driving service line focus it's really kind of building the affinity for us and creating those community connections, like reiterating those community connections that we've built over, you know, 65 years and making sure that people feel that way. And, you know, they, some of the measurement we have too, we're doing things like our, our brand awareness surveys and things. And we've added some questions uh, that we're deploying in June around, you know, who's, who's your trust, most trusted healthcare system in the area and, you know, have you seen messaging and do you feel reassured, things like that. So we've added some, some of those type things so we can feel like, you know, is this messaging going to have an impact? And that's how we measure it. So a little bit different, again, a little bit softer than a, a strictly volume play. And that's not what we're going after here. Yeah, I feel like we could talk about campaigns like this and like the timing for a long time. And I know we're, uh, knowing we're looking at time. Um, I would love to ask you, what are the big takeaways for folks? I mean, Marcom's professionals need some, I mean, uh, I think everyone's looking to, around and saying, what can I learn from the person next to me? So anything you would share around just like things you've learned through this whole process? Well, I'll start with one just to, you know, on leadership level. So anyone who's leading a team, I think um, my team's done a fantastic job, but they're working from home, they're working long hours. And so as a leader, I think it's just nice to, to check in to make sure you stay as connected as possible with them and also to make sure that people aren't working more than they should. And the productivity level is off the chart. Um, but, you know, sometimes you have to remind people like, hey, make sure you take a half hour for lunch, take a walk outside, do something because... We are, you know, at the end of the day, whenever I work from home, I'm like, wow, the hours are crazy. And then we don't have our traditional meetings anymore either. I mean, we're doing stuff by phone, but, you know, you're not having those, you know, weekly check-ins in person and all, you know, so, so I think the amount of meeting time is down, but the amount of work time overall is higher. So, you know, as a leader, I think people need to check in and you need to give yourself some, some of that self check-in too. And then the last thing I think is just flexibility. I mean, I was talking about the flexibility of the campaign, but you have to do that with everything. I think you have to be able to sort of turn on a dime right now. You have to, you cannot rely on the long planning cycles that we had. Things are just standing up really quickly. And so you've got to be flexible too. And like, you know, I, I don't think this is a time where you're going to write a 12 month uh, marketing plan. You're probably going to do a one to three month plan and reassess it along the way. 
knowing, kind of relying on your expertise to make sure you're doing the right thing. But you know, again, for right now, we're not doing the early planning. I mean, I have no idea what I want to run in market 12 months from now, because who knows what the market's going to look like. Um, so that flexibility and adaptability, I think is, is probably a, the second most important thing, other than just taking care of yourself, uh, making sure you don't burn out, making sure your team doesn't burn out. Well, I think those are some wise words. I know uh, things we have to hear, even in the agency side, I think it's important to remember that, you know, got to prevent Zoom burnout or Zoom out or whatever we're going to call it uh, in the next near future. Um, yeah, um, um, I'd like to zoom out sometimes. I think that maybe that's the word actually we can go with, for, at least for today. Um, all right, so that's, I think that's it for what we can do today. Alan, thank you so much. Super helpful to have and um, to hear perspective. Uh, you, you obviously lead in some really cool creative work and also just some great marketing people. You've told us a little bit about on the, on the pre-call and others and it uh, sounds like it's um, it's quite the passion you have. So thank, thank you for, for sharing it a little bit with us today. You bet, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Um, okay, so guys, that's it for our show today. Uh, please let us know if there's something else you'd like to cover by posting in the Zoom chat tool. Um, next week, we have um, some uh, other guests coming. Uh, Sarah Natoli joining us as a guest host alongside Annie Bush, who's head of marketing at Careport Health. Uh, they're an Allscripts company who will be discussing their COVID-19 resources that are available for health system marketers and communicators. Uh, remember, you can always go to the website for recording of today's episode and all the content related to the crisis uh, at thinkrevivehealth.com slash COVID-19 and all of you out there. Um, I'll say this just as a reviver. Um, thank you for the amazing work. Thank you for like standing up and like the long hours and like the, the constant meetings. Um, your skills as health system marketers and communicators um, make us happy to help you. So thanks for the opportunity and we, we, we uh, love work with you guys. So uh, until then, until next week, um, have a good, have a good weekend and uh, hopefully get some rest. We'll talk to you then. Bye.